population. And the mechanism we'll cover shortly, but in an anti-dihydroxylation, you form what's called an epoxide. An epoxide is a three-membered ring with an oxygen in it. It's awesome. Is it strained? Yes. Yes, yes horribly strained. And, right, you can bring in a nucleophile and open it up. There's actually two ways to do it. Your book only talks of one way. I'd like to talk about both ways. Uh, but, but the mechanism is essentially uh, this. Let me just write it out real quick. Once you form the epoxide, however you form it, let's go like this. That's what we'll talk about next. So once you have the epoxide, you can break the ring open, uh, but oxygen's a bad leaving group. So even though this is kind of an intramolecular leaving group, uh, it's still a bad leaving group. So normally what they do is they bring in H plus and some water, perhaps. It doesn't have to be water. It could be anything. And they protonate it first. And then you'll have this. And that'll leave as an OH, which is a good leaving group. Uh, it'll leave as an OH neutral, not an OH. Like, oh. Yeah, it'll leave as part of an alcohol. So you're essentially making an alcohol out of it, okay? And as a result, you can bring in another nucleophile. Oh, those and these electrons go back here. Normally, OH is a bad leaving group, but this OH is a good leaving group. It's part of the alcohol. It's not hydroxide. It's going to be hydroxide. Yeah, it's not going to be hydroxide. Yeah, it's going to be an alcohol. Yay. And so what you end up with is something that looks like this. Ooh, I know it's working because I can't write on this board. Like that. And then a base can come along. kick that guy back, and then you end up with a diol. Oops. Okay, I'm try, drawing it funny like this because this is another one of those anti-reactions. Right? What does anti mean? Form on, Form on opposite side. So if it was a sin hydroxylation, the OH would be on the same side. If it was an anti-hydroxylation, they end up on the opposite sides. This is an anti-dihydroxylation -hydro reaction. So first you take an alkene. So the general process looks like this. You take an alkene, you make an epoxide, and then you form the diol. And this is an anti-process. Trying to write too fast, it doesn't like it. Okay, make sense? Okay, this is what we covered. This is what we covered last time. Okay. So does the epoxide uh, refer to the actual ring that's also yeah. only the, the only two carbons, or can it have Yeah, it's only the two. Yeah, so it's a three-membered ring with an oxygen in it. So this is the epoxide ring. This is SN2, by the way. This attack that's over here. This is an SN2 reaction. It can happen on a tertiary carbon. Okay. Turns out this reaction is regioselective. Okay. What does that mean? It can happen in multiple places. It prefers one. Okay. So I'll give you some example molecules. Let's do this. Let's say the molecule looks like. Um, <laughs> this and then I uh, use a peroxide remember that's the peroxy acetic acid is what we used uh, earlier uh, MCPBA is another peroxide and I'll I'll, I'll lift the le I left the P out sorry yeah this is also a peroxide. 
Oh, it's so slow. Peroxide. There we go. That's also peroxide. You'll end up with getting an epoxide from the peroxide. Okay, and, and then if you do this experiment with H2O, the product always looks like this. Where those two OHs will be anti to each other. Okay, but I said it's regioselective, so how can you tell it's regioselective? If you do it with an alcohol, oh, so H2O and H plus, sorry. So you need the acid in there. Let's say you do uh, CH3, OH, and H+. Plus. Then this is your major product. Like that. Okay. Now... The alcohol in the bottom reaction and the water in the top reaction, right? Those are the nucleophiles in this step of the reaction. So they're what attack the protonated epoxide. And when that attack happens, it happens the more substituted carbon, okay? Just as if a carbocation was forming, right? That's where the nucleophile prefers to go. So that's what you have to remember. So the question is, why does that happen? It happens because, first, there's two things. This is a, a three-membered ring. So the, the geometry at this point here is almost flat. So you, it's an SN2 style reaction because you have the three-membered ring on one side that closes the bond angle between the oxygens and the carbons. The other carbon-carbon bonds spread out. And so a nucleophile can get coming in attack. The other thing is that this is a tertiary carbon. So it's easier for positive charge to build up there. So in the transition state, as this group breaks away, uh, I should say as this oxygen begins to leave with the hydrogen on it, okay, it produces a bigger positive charge here than it does here. So it's easier to actually go through the transition state through the more substituted carbon. Even though sterically it looks like it's more hindered. Yeah. Transition state energy is smaller. It's going to look something, the transition state will look something like this. Let me do this. Like that. So the oxygen is going to approach this carbon because it has the lower transition state because this positive charge is stabilized by all the groups around it. Okay? It's the whole hyperconjugation thing. Even though it looks, it looks counterintuitive, it looks like, oh, that's more sterically hindered, you expect it to come at the end rather than in the, in the middle. Make sense? Yes. I just have to make sure it's recorded. Okay, so if it was carbanion-like, which side would the alcohol be attached to? It would be on the other side. Remember, carbocations like to form at the more substituted side. Carbanions on the less substituted side. So if you run this with a strong nucleophile, and again, this is not catalyzed, if you do it this way, and you brought, let's say, S minus, and it attacks, It'll, it prefers to attack there because that's the less substitute side. Because the nucleophiles, it comes in, deposits a negative charge wherever it's attacking, and it's more stable on that side. So when the nucleophile comes in on something like this,
you'll eventually end up with that. Okay. So more substituted side under acidic conditions, carbocation-like, less substituted side uh, under basic conditions, more carbanion-like. Okay, um, this was the uh, formation of the epoxide. It's a concerted uh, reaction. Uh, when you do the concerted reaction, the oxygen acts just like bromine does. You guys remember the bromination reaction? Br2, halogenation reaction. The Br2 is attacked, for example, if I have this. Br is, uh, Br2 is polarizable. It acts as both the electrophile and the nucleophile, and it undergoes a transition that looks something like this. Something like that. Okay, so what ends up happening, though, in this reaction uh, eventually is you form this three-membered ring, which we call the cyclic bromonium ion. And part of what helps this along is that what you get off of this side is Br minus. It's a good leaving group. Okay. So over here, when you look at this, the oxygen is acting with this bond is acting as both the nucleophile and the electrophile. The instability of this bond is what causes this oxygen to behave like the nucleophile. Remember, peroxide, the OO bond is very weak. And so when this bond breaks and the electrons come here, this pulls the electrons from the double bond and at the same time attacks the double bond, just like the bromine does. And then what leaves is this. This is a uh, carboxylic acid, a stable leaving group. So this is essentially serving the same functions as Br minus does. Good leaving group, and then one of the atoms acts as both an electrophile and a nucleophile. Okay. Sorry. This was also a characteristic of the oxymercuration demercuration reaction, where you form the three-membered ring with the mercury. So this is a common theme in all these mechanisms. So. If you learn them together as a group, right, study them all at the same time together, it, you have a tendency it makes it a little easier to remember the mechanisms. Okay. There's another uh, way to dihydroxylate something, and this is known as a syndihydroxylation. And in the syndihydroxylation reaction, you have osmium tetroxide, that's what we call this thing, uh, very expensive and toxic. Okay. And what the osmium does is, again, just like the bromine or like the oxygen does in the previous reaction, it acts as both as the electrophile and the nucleophile in the reaction. So this oxygen grabs the uh, electrons from the ring. This bond breaks this way, and then this bond comes out over here. And then you form this osmate ester. which can be reduced, I guess that's the right term, yeah, can be reduced by uh, sodium sulfite or sodium bisulfite. And what you end up with is OS3 over here somewhere. OSO3, like that. Okay, so this is a concerted reaction. Both oxygens are added on the same side. So, unlike the anti dihydroxylation, right, whether on the opposite side, syn dihydroxylation puts them on the same side. Uh, there are cheaper ways to do this. Um, one is to use permanganate. And just show you, this is the permanganate reaction. I don't know if you notice, it's exactly the same reaction. 
I think all they did is change the letters on the inside here, and it's exactly the same mechanism. Again, it's concerted. You end up getting uh, oxygen attached uh, to both sides, uh, sorry, on the same side of the pi bond, where the pi bond was. And then they use sodium hydroxide to displace these oxygens from the manganese. Okay, so the sodium hydroxide, the OH essentially comes in, attacks here, and breaks that off. That becomes an O minus on that side. Um, only problem with this is, um, is that it tends to also break the double bonds in half. and actually cuts the molecule at the double bond. So in, in a lot of ways, that's why people prefer to use osmium, because it doesn't have that tendency. So because osmium is expensive, somebody's come up with this grand idea to use a catalyst with it, um, NMO, let's see, what does that stand for? N oxide, NMO, I don't remember what the, it's a methyl oxide, was that miracle curse? Yeah, that's fine. But, but this, is, this is the catalyst or the co-catalyst for the osmium tetroxide. So after, when this reaction takes place, the NMO regenerates the osmium tetroxide and is relatively inexpensive. Um, but it doesn't have that tendency that permanganate has to cut the bond in half. Okay. Um, just a few more things to cover in this chapter. Um, one of them is oxidative cleavage. This is what I was saying we were starting with before. The first thing I want you to do is recognize what the pattern is in the, when you cleave or cut a double bond. Okay. So if you look at this molecule, this double bond here, O3 is ozone. Okay. Again, ozone is polarizable in a sense that it has both an electrophilic side and a nucleophilic side. It both wants to attack and absorb electrons um, with its electrons. But the pattern in the, in the product is if you take this and you just cut it. So if you were to cut this and put little oxygens here, right, that's, the, that's the product that you get. Okay. DMS is just this. And it turns out this is a reducing reducing reagent. So what happens is when this reaction takes place, you get the least oxidized products out, okay? Less oxidized products out. More oxidized would be things like this or this. Why do I say those are more oxidizing or more oxidized? Look at it. Why is that more oxidized? More, yeah, it's more oxygen, right? More bonds to oxygen. One of the ways that we treat oxidation states, you can calculate oxidation states. You okay, Connor? All right. This is a four plus, all right? These are two minus each. This is actually three plus. And these ones are 2 plus, or actually that one's a 1 plus because there's a hydrogen here. So the more positive the oxidation state, right, that's the more oxidized state. So when you're working with this reaction, when you see dimethyl sulfide, you have to think that the products are going to be more reduced. What you're going to learn later is you'll learn that if you use a more oxidizing condition, more oxidizing reagent like peroxide, 
What you'll end up with instead is you'll end up with something that looks like this. That is it's the same reaction following ozonolysis. You, you use O3 with the reagent, and then you do an oxidizing conditions, you'll end up with a more oxidized product. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, this is a mechanism for it. Uh, it's the same, but it's kind of the same mechanism that we looked at before for like bromination, except for in this case, the, when you did bromination or oxymercuration, the bromine or the mercury are both the electrophile and the nucleophile. Um, they are electrophiles because they had good leaving groups. They're nucleophiles because they have electrons on them. So this oxygen is the electrophile. Oops. And this one is the nucleophile. And this follows that same general principle. We have a positive charge here. So this positive charge wants to pull electrons to itself, right? So when it does that, it pulls the electrons towards itself from this bond. So as a result, this pi, it attacks this pi bond so that these electrons can come to this oxygen. So you end up with this intermediate, which actually does this funny little rearrangement where it actually breaks apart and then flips around. And then you end up with this guy. And this is known as an ozonide. And then when you, reduce, when you use mild reducing conditions, that's the DMS, you end up with, for example, two ketones or two aldehydes. Okay. You can also use, um, like it says down here, zinc. This is a reducing agent. Because it has the zinc, the metal has electrons to give up to form zinc 2 plus. Right? So it can reduce, uh, keep this in the reduced state. All right, so let's predict product for this reaction. What would it be? Got to break the double bond, all right? Put an oxygen here, oxygen there. So the product would look like, I mean, it would be easy just to draw it like this. Just like that. Right. This down here. I don't know why they did it like that, but that's DMS. Okay. What was the reactant that gave this molecule down here? How would you figure that out? Is that? Oh, that's the ending product? Yes, yeah, the product, right? It has the, the C double bond O's in it. It started from an alkene, right? Predict a bicyclic reactant used to form the product. Now, those oxygens weren't in the original ring, right? So, what, when I look at it, I go, oh, look, there's like carbons here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that could be a six-membered ring, right? And then you can go one, two, three, four, and then five, and that would be a five-membered ring, right? See what I'm doing? Yeah, across three, four, they're going to be connected. So they got to be connected between three and four, okay? So what I've find a lot of times is easy to do is I just number one of the chains so this is going to be a six-membered ring 
this is going to be a five-membered ring. Okay. So go one, two, three, four, five, six. Oop. I have a hard time drawing with this tablet. Draw a six-membered ring. Now, where is the double bond going to be on that ring? One six. Between one and six, because that's where these are, right? So, arbitrarily, pick two carbons and call them one and six, okay? So if I call this one one and this one six, I could do that. And it's connected to another ring between which carbons? Three and four. So one, two, three, right? So it has to be connected here, and it's a five-membered ring. Now, between three and the other end of the ring, I got that right? Yeah. I have to have a double bond, right? So where does that go? Does it go to the right on three, or does it go to up on three? Right. To the right like that. And that's the starting molecule. Um, if you did it like this and you cut it here and here, right, it would be all one long chain. It would just go all the way around like this. Right? You could also take from three, right? So three, four, uh, five, six, seven, so three, four, and five, six, and seven. It has to be between three and seven. So just use numbers on, it's not the numbers you're using for nomenclature, just put numbers on the rings to identify where those bonds were cut. So let's just do some practice. So this is uh, predict the major products for the reaction below. So this is ozonolysis. So what does that do? Two OHs. What is what's and then the dihydroxylation. Sin or anti? Sin. B yeah, because the osmium, right, both the oxygens on the pi bond come from the osmium at the same time, okay? So that means what you're going to get is something, for example, a product. Oops. It looks like this. So that part's not going to change, but what you'll have is you'll have OH is going up. And then down here you have a CH3 going down. So that implies that both the OHs were added at the same time, right? On the same side because they're both going in the same direction. What else will I get? You, you can get the same right addition but on the other side so when you do that you have a CH3 going up CH3 going up like that and then OH and then OH like that uh, What's the relationship between those uh, isomers? Are they enantiomers or disteriomers? Dice, yeah, disteriomers. They're enantiomers. If you don't have any other stereocenters to start with, you'd end up with enantiomers. But since you already have one, and you're only creating uh, two new, and you're creating two new ones, they have to be disteriomers. Okay, so your book makes a big deal of this. 
Uh, I like to make a big deal of it, uh, but they call it one-step synthesis. What is a one-step synthesis? Yeah, which is a chemical reaction. So all these reactions that you're learning right now, like addition of HBr to an alkene or an elimination reaction using a bulky base, these are all one-step synthesis. The way you usually t um, plan a one-step synthesis is you look at the product and you say to yourself, how did I make that? What kind of reaction produces that functional group? They actually have a name for this. It's called retrosynthetic analysis. It means you look at the product to figure out what you started with. Right? So you're working backwards. So you have these kind of like, you know, you, I don't know if you remember doing this. Uh, you probably some, some of you probably still do. But um, when you have the answer key for a book, right, and you look at the answer, having not read or having not studied, and you try to work out backwards, like, well, how did they do that? So you just start playing with it until you figure out how you do it. That's kind of like retrosynthetic analysis. You look at the answer and you say, well, this is what I want to make, right? How do I make that? What kind of reagents do I need? So, for example, let's say you didn't have, like, this stuff on the left, okay? But you saw this, and X and Y were, let's say, halogens. Bromination, Bromination of an alkene would be, th that's the kind of thing, like, see, oh, I see two halogens. I could do that with the with uh, Br2 on an alkene, that might be one of the steps in a synthesis, okay? But we call it a one-step synth synthesis simply because you're learning to recognize, oh, that's a kind of product that I could make from something else. Well, so far, all we've dealt with is alkylhalides, alcohols, and alkene. So it's not too hard to, like, kind of figure. What's hard is the stereochemistry and the other things that come into play when you do these things. Okay. Um, if you did something like this, right, say, so, oh, I've got this, and I'm starting with that. It's a substitution of some sort. Or if I do something like that, elimination, elimination right? So, again, one-step synthesis. The trick is, is to start uh, being able to do it in multi-step reactions, where you're trying to go through a bunch of steps and apply it. Right, right. So that's actually in the next part called multi-step syntheses. And the book, this book's really cool. It has, even though we kind of teach it the whole time we go along, when we get to chapter 12, it's kind of like a chapter that we just refer to. It's uh, all about synthesis and strategies. So how do you look at products? How do you look at reactants to figure out what the reactions need to be? Okay. So let's say this is the product you want to make. How would you do that? Well, actually, they're just saying to go from here to here, right? So another thing you got to get used to is you got to get used to the idea that one starting material can give you multiple different kinds of products. Yeah, going opposite directions, right? So, it, oh, and enantiomer. Um, and a lot of times when you do like uh, reactions. With alkenes, you get mixtures of enantiomers. Okay. Like in the last one, we didn't because there was already one stereo center there. Yeah, this has got a name. This is known as the this is known as the halo, halogen and a hydration reaction together. So it's called halohydrin, right? So so you would have to know, for example, that's um, oops, like B. R2 and water. And on the right, it's H plus and water. That's just a hydration reaction. Okay. How do you know these things? What? what? No, yeah, but how do you know them like you know them? Like you just memorize them, right? So my my hope is what you guys are doing is making flashcards now with just reactions on one side and then like the reagent on the other side, All right? With both the names and the reagents so that you know like, oh, when you get to a synthesis problem that's multi-step, you don't want to have to try to figure out all the reagents while you're going along. You just want to know that you can do that transformation. 
But if you know the mechanisms, it makes it a lot easier. Of course, you got to know the mechanisms. All right. How would you do... This is a multi-step synthesis. How would you go from here to here? Now, do you know anything that just lets a bromine move? Uh, you could have a rearrangement. Uh, involves a carbocation, right? What else could there be? I mean, there is a cheating way to do it, which would be really easy. But... Yeah. So this is the, like, if you look at this, this is the most stable carbocation. This is a less stable. So you have to get this thing to move, right? So one of the things you should think about is what series of react, what, what reaction would give me this? Well, you could have an alcohol here, or you could have a double bond here, and you could add HBr to either one, right? So think about this product. They, they show you the answer down here. Sorry. But I'm trying to help you think, like, how do you know that? Because it's not clear how you know that from the slide. But you could get to this product from here. Or you could get to it from there. And actually, both of them use the same reagent. It's just HBr. It's really slow. Then the question is, if it's one of these two that is the intermediate product, right, can I get to either one of these from here? For the, oh, this, this is an addition going backwards. But the, and this is an SN1 substitution. You protonate the OH, and then Br is a good nucleophile. So you can go from either one of these to go to here. The question is, can you go from here to one of these? And that's what you're trying to piece together, right? So how, do you, how would you make this? This is formed from an elimination reaction, right? How do you form this? Well, this is actually from a hydration reaction. This you would get starting with this as well, right? So the best thing probably in this reaction is to look at this and say, well, I can do an elimination of this to form the alkene, and if I add HBr to it, then I'll get that. Okay. So there's patterns that you'll see. Like if you're given an alkyl halide as a starting material, how many different kinds of reactions can you do with an alkyl halide? I mean, it seems like a lot, but really it's substitution. You can do elimination. I get the two basic things that you can do with it, okay? You may change the, the alkyl halide to some other functional group, but it still comes down to being a substitution or elimination. And how do you form an alkyl halide? Well, it's, again, it's a substitution or an addition. So there's only a couple ways that you can put these things together. Okay. Um, so once you've worked out that part, like what the pattern of functional group changes is, then what you have to work out is the details. So the first thing is figure out what the functional group changes are and what's the connected pathway. Second thing that you do is you look at the types of reagents that you have handy in order to get that kind of product. Okay. So you know you look at, oh, here's an elimination reaction. Well, I could use a couple of different kinds of bases, right? But base, basically, anything that's strong, right, and not as nucleophilic, but really anything that's strong is going to favor elimination because this is a secondary alkyl halide. Secondary alkyl halides always favor elimination with strong base by E2. So it's going to have to be a strong base, and it has to not be bulky because if it's bulky, you'll get the anti product, right, the Hoffman product, anti Zeitzeck product. Here, for the addition, it just has to be HBr. So again, working out what the functional group changes are, how, what class of reactions can I do to this, and then work out the reagents afterward.
Okay. Uh, let's do one more. I'm going to build off that last one. Okay, so let's say instead of starting with the BR on the secondary carbon, let's start with the BR on the tertiary carbon. And then put it there. Same kinds of transformations, right? What can I do to an alkyl halide? I can either substitute or eliminate, right? If I'm going to have a BR back onto it, I need a double bond. So I need, I need an alkene here. Yeah, so you're going to do an elimination, and then we're going to do an addition. So if I'm going to do the elimination, that's, again, the same kind of problem, but I have to use a non-sterically hindered base to get the uh, more substitute or more stable alkene. So that would be, uh, I don't know, MeOH or something like this. MeO minus, sorry. It has to be strong. So that makes it E2. What about the addition? This is one of those ones we looked at. We didn't learn the mechanism. We're going to learn it in Chapter 11. Right, it's on the less substitute. So it's the anti-Markovnikov addition. And there was a trick for that, right? We didn't learn the mechanism for it. But the trick is to just do HBr, but put peroxide in it. And the peroxide makes it anti-Markovnikov. So you can get the less substituted uh, alkyl halide that way. And ultimately, that allows you to do like things like this to make the less stable double bond on the terminal end. So you can actually move like a double bond around using these techniques or move the alkyl halide. You could actually end up with the alkyl halide. Uh, sometimes they'll say walk it all the way to the end of a molecule. Yeah. Like how did how did you know if you want to get the BR all the way down here and it starts over here, you do an elimination and then you do an anti-Markovnikov addition and then you do another a Hoffman elimination or anti-Zaitsev elimination and another anti-Markovnikov. You can take like the bromine that starts in the most stable spot and move it all the way to the end of the molecule. So they're walking it to the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's, it's the application over and over and over again of the same reaction. OK, how would you do this reaction? All right. So this is the transformation. They want to walk the OH to the end, right? Well, they're actually just going to stick it out here. Again, uh, what can you do in alcohol? You can do eliminations, right? Um, you might want to do a replacement of this with a halogen and then use a strong bulky base, like if you're thinking about to get to this, right? Because if, if you use something that's not strong bulky base, you'll end up with a bond over here. And then you have to do an addition, but what kind of addition is this again? Again, it's the anti-product, right? It's the, yeah. So again, there's reagents that allow you to put the OH in the more substituted and, o and put the OH in the less substituted. If you remember these, this is the hydroboration reaction. That's the first step. And then the second step is just H2O2. So the first step is the hydroboration part, and the second step is known as the oxidation step. And it's done in strong, strongly basic conditions, so sodium hydroxide or something like that. Okay. The first one is just probably one. I would probably do 
TSCL and then to or SOCl2, either one of those to make an alkyl halide of the alcohol, and then a strong bulky base. like that, okay? All right. is extra problems at the back. If you want to do these ones and ask me later, that's fine. Um, I have more stuff to do. Let's take a five-minute break. Are you going to keep lecturing? Yeah.